This is about social dualism. Uh, I've had multiple titles for this topic. One of them is uh, coming from a book by Stephen Graham and Simon Marvin called Splintering Urbanism. Another one uh, comes from a colleague uh, in the Netherlands who writes about the air conditioning divide. Uh, but basically, I, I still like the term social dualism. This idea of social dualism uh, is a more technical, far-reaching uh, concept that society tends to split uh, increasingly, society seems to split between the extremely well-off minority and everyone else whose conditions seem to worsen year by year. And this is a fundamental characteristic uh, of triumphal capitalism. Capitalism, there are two types of capitalism. Capitalism with a small c is what Adam Smith put forward, the operation of markets. Uh, if you have lots of different firms in competition, uh, they will compete to satisfy the needs of society. And basically, it's an automatic readjusting machine that beautifully and simply uh, pushes firms to do a better job at what they're doing, to lower their costs and provide higher quality output. And that's, this, that's the capitalism that we romantically refer to when we say free markets. Uh, and there's a whole ideology of free market capitalism that you grew up with and you're all familiar with and I'm sure you all have opinions about. Uh, but the mythology of free market capitalism that it, that it creates efficiency uh, is only part of the story. Uh, the other part of the story is that while corporations are preaching the gospel of free market, Adam Smith, lots of competition, they are spending most of their efforts to establish monopolies. How many people pay more than $20 a month for their cell phone? Alicia, how much do you pay for your cell phone? Um, I don't know. Well, do they pay more than $20 a month? Oh, uh, yeah. Probably okay. $50 a month. Now, in some of these slides, one or, one or more of these slides, you're going to see people who I'm claiming are dirt poor. They're making $1 a day or $2 a day, and they have cell phones, and they're texting on their cell phones. What's with that? How can they afford? You're telling me these people are poor. Well, I need to explain to you. We here in North America are in a very special situation. Our phone companies, there's not, it's not a monopoly. It's not one firm. But there's a consortium of less than a dozen phone companies. And they have us by the short hairs. They control us. They have established an expectation that a cell phone should cost $40 a month, $60 a month. And if you have an iPhone, some people pay $100 a month. You may know that. You may be one of them. Um, so how can people in these sweatshops that we're going to be showing you, how can they afford a cell phone? Well, they have competition. The rest of the world pays less than $10 a month for their cell phones. I'm really sorry to break this to you, but you are being stolen from through this so-called free market system, which is not so free. They have limited the number of companies that can offer you services through, uh, for cell phones. And there's an agreement among them that they're not going to charge less than $40 a month. And they're going to, together, in concert, slowly ramp that up towards $100 a month. This is a huge success story for monopoly capitalism that they've convinced Americans to pay a hundred times more or ten times more than the rest of the world uh, for their cell phone service. Most of which is not as good. My cell phone doesn't work in my house, yet the, the ten dollar cell phone that I bought when I went to Sumatra worked 40 kilometers off the coast of the northernmost tip of Sumatra right after the big tsunami wiped everything out. They had no electricity, but my cell phone worked beautifully. I could talk to my wife with greater clarity from that remote location off the coast of Sumatra after a tsunami than I could from my own living room here in, Cam in Cambridge. So um, to quickly get this material into the record of the class, let me move through these slides. Um, how many people 
know who Nelson Mandela is? Okay, so you know about South Africa? Do you know the word apartheid? That there was a very strict system of pass cards where every citizen in South Africa had to have a card in their pocket that designated what race they were. And you could enter a building or enter a portion of the city or not, dependent on what your pass card said. And so throughout the city, throughout buildings, throughout the built environment, there were pass card control points. And you could either enter or not, depending on your race, as declared on your pass card. And if you didn't have a pass card, you were thrown immediately in jail. Well, uh, the, South Africa is not the only place where this system was established. Um, South Africa was established as a Dutch colony, and then there was a war between the British and the Dutch and the British won. But this was a Dutch system of racial segregation. Back in the Netherlands, they had a very liberal, open society, but in the colonies, the Dutch were brutal colonizers, and they had the same system in Batavia, which is now called Jakarta, uh, except they didn't use pass cards, they used uh, clothing. And so there were laws that said who could wear what clothing. And you could wear shoes or not wear shoes, depending on your status. And so this gentleman on the left is a Mardiker. He was converted to Christianity. And so because he's a Christian, he is allowed by law to wear shoes. But he's not allowed to have a buckle on his shoe. If, he, if status rose, the law would allow him to wear a pewter buckle. And if his status rose further, he could wear a brass buckle. And if his status rose further, uh, he, he could have buttons, a certain number of buttons. And so, uh, and the woman on the, on the right um, is restricted to be, being barefoot uh, because she's a woman. She's not allowed to wear shoes. Uh, and so these are the way things were governed is the laws that uh, required certain dress, certain, you could carry certain things, you could wear certain hats, you could wear your hair in a certain way. Chinese had to have, uh, by local custom, they had to have a ponytail um, and until a certain point when the ponytail became a symbol of revolution and revolt, in which case you were not allowed to wear a ponytail. Uh, and so these illustrations were actually part of the enforcement of the legal system that controlled what people were allowed to wear and how they were allowed to travel. So you were allowed to have one horse on your carriage, four horses on your carriage, six horses on your carriage. You were allowed to be carried by servants in this way if you were a Chinese merchant of a certain class. And so your method of moving around the city was dictated by these same rules. And I think I mentioned this when I talked about the, the cars people drive, that your right of way in present day Jakarta is determined to a large extent by what car you drive. Whoever's car is worth the most uh, has the right of way when you arrive at an intersection. And so when people buy a car, they buy a car with that in mind. Um, reaching back into uh, the traditions of uh, how these differences of class were negotiated, there are always stories going back in history of slavery and genocide and uh, in perverse uh, brutality of the, the powerful over the uh, enslaved and powerless dominated subjugated peoples. There are far fewer positive stories. So this is a positive story that comes from the built form of a neighborhood in uh, Java that the king is at the center of the society uh, and power uh, devolves according to a hierarchy of nobles and princes throughout the neighborhoods and throughout the cities. And this is what it looks like in physical form, where the, um, the house at the center of the noble uh, is surrounded by the immediate courtyard of the family of the, of the prince. And then the neighborhood that supplies the labor for a factory, the prince is obligated to set up some type of economic activity, like a factory that produces textiles or processes sugar or does something that maintains the economic well-being of the neighborhood. And so the prince is not just a feudal overlord uh, oppressing the people uh, under him. 
he is actually responsible for the economic livelihood of the community. And tax often comes in the form of labor. And so um, the, the able-bodied men of the community would need to supply seven or eight days of hard labor in service to the, the prince in building things or fixing drainage systems. And this is how the society worked. If someone broke their arm and could not work, um, the, the community would, would take care of that person. And I've told you stories about that. Um, down at the bottom, you see the Chinese shop houses uh, appearing along the major road. Uh, and that was another source of economic activity for this neighborhood. And in times of insurrection and warfare, the people of the neighborhood would rise up and defend the household and the community under the prince's guidance. And this is just the architectural form that that would take. Um, uh, and this is called the Magar Sardi uh, system. Magar means uh, wall. And so this community is really a walled enclave, not so different from the gated communities um, of today. Uh, but it has a different social uh, hierarchy than uh, what gated communities produce. Now this was um, one of the idealistic Dutch uh, planner architects of the colonial period in the 1920s in planning the new capital for the Dutch uh, colony. Uh, here the Gedung Sate uh, in the center planned a neighborhood right next to the capital complex. And in, this, in the outer crust of this neighborhood are the big houses of the wealthy colonial uh, officials with uh, automobile access to these wide streets. But in the interior of the block is uh, a modernized version of the Magrav Sari, where this is where the more poor people would live. They would enter through a gateway and they would have smaller houses, live in this communal situation and there would be schools and open space and collective facilities. And so it was very much a physical configuration that had a social uh, goal to it. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we see a very interesting thing here. We see the new, on the right, I mean on the left, you see uh, the new Palace of Performing Arts in Jakarta. And in the foreground, you see a bus stop. And so you see the bus stop aligned with the front gate to the Center for the Performing Arts, and you say, oh, that's a very nice arrangement. The people can take mass transit and then go into the uh, Performing Arts uh, Center. But uh, viewed from above, on the left, you see a different situation. You see the fence that surrounds the Performing Arts Center, and uh, you see this driveway system uh, where uh, the reality of this is if you arrive at this uh, bus stop, you actually have to walk about uh, more than a half a mile to get to the driveway entrance to this uh, facility, then walk down the driveway uh, back the way you came and walk up the ramp while cars, well, I guess there's a stairway there too, but cars are coming and going. The drivers are dropping off uh, their passengers and um, this is basically uh, a sharp slap in the face uh, to anyone who doesn't have a car and a driver uh, because this performing arts center is clearly set up for, for cars and actually there is no pedestrian entrance uh, connecting between the bus stop and the front entrance of the performing arts center. Similarly, um, the gated communities uh, of Asia are to a large extent uh, walled off fortresses where the wall creates this impermeable boundary uh, where there had been roads and footpaths connecting adjacent communities. So when uh, the, the land next to your village is sold off for a gated golf community, you are likely to lose your access to uh, your job or to your sister's family's house or to the church you were going to before, or to the market that you used to buy and sell things at. And so this is a map that, this is a map that shows uh, the different uh, housing developments, and there you'll notice that they tend to have 
one way, one or two ways in and out. So there's one way in, and these two are not connected. If you want to go over to your friend's house, you have to go out and back in. Actually, to get to this one, you've got to go out back in here and go to your friend's house. So you might be able to throw a stone and hit your friend's house, but it would take you an hour or two to walk there. Um, and probably you won't go unless you have a motorbike, which everyone does. And so these, um, these situations create extreme um, conditions of enclosure. So modern land, I love that name, um, has a gate here and is this vast complex with a golf course at the center. And there's only one way in and out, and that's it. Um, this is Lippo Karawachi, which has made an appearance several times before in this class. Because um, before we talked about it, because the developer uh, is from the Riadi family, and you may remember the Riadi name because um, Riadi was one of the illegal contributors to Bill Clinton's presidential campaign. Um, a very wealthy Indonesian, Chinese Indonesian, who went to college in Southern California and came back and said, I want to bring the Southern California life to wealthy Indonesians. So he built this high-rise downtown area as part of his housing complex, a golf course at the center, an island uh, which is, looks a lot like the capital of Sri Lanka in a way, um, where the palace goes on the island. Um, and, but he did a very socially progressive thing. He gated the whole city so that inside the city you wouldn't have to have gated enclaves one after the other. Once you were in the big gate of Lippo Karawachi, the different neighborhoods could actually be interconnected. Um, but it didn't work out that way. People didn't feel secure, and so he had to retrofit these fences in order to divide every section within the city of Lippo Karawachi uh, so that people felt uh, safe uh, in case there were riots. And in, indeed, after this picture was taken, there were riots in 1998. Um, when President Suharto was uh, being uh, deposed, uh, they burned the shopping mall in Lippo Karawachi. Uh, and the other progressive thing that they allowed is that they opened these gates and allowed um, the, the people from the neighboring community. So in the background here is a government formal housing uh, community and, but those people who were living here were completely isolated and cut off from everything, all access to the rest of the world when Lippo Karawachi was built. Uh, and so the owners and operators of Lippo Karawachi have allowed these gates to stay open uh, as long as there's no trouble. And so these people actually cut through Lippo Karawachi to get to work. Um, and they've also, uh, in order to reduce the social tension, uh, they've created a kind of an informal market uh, within Lipo Karawachi because this is what Indonesians really like. They like to buy and sell things and they like to hang out in places like this. And so they closed the street and one day a week they allowed this type of market. Now we're going to go to Dharavi, India. Um, this is a major formal water supply that supplies the city of Mumbai. Uh, and uh, these are rubber hoses that are tapping into that water supply. Each hose goes to a different household. Uh, and this is how the informal settlements get fresh water is in a lot of cases. Um, and this is that same water supply serving as a roadway um, that doesn't flood because it's raised up. Um, Mumbai, uh, you've heard of Dharavi because you saw the movie uh, Slumdog Millionaire. Uh, it's the largest slum in the world, uh, and uh, it's on extremely uh, expensive land, extremely valuable land like Wentworth, um, but the occupants of the land, uh, also like Wentworth, uh, has no way uh, of uh, yielding the benefit of the value of that land. In Wentworth's case, because Wentworth doesn't seem to know any better, in Dharavi's case, because they don't have legal 
title to the land. And so little by little, the government um, put, you know, tries making developments, but the, the vast majority of Dharavi is still um, slums. An architect, an American trained architect from Mumbai has proposed using all the tricks of architectural uh, chicanery, using photo images of Kalatrava, high tech medical, to sell people on the idea that Dharavi could be redeveloped uh, for the benefit of the people. Um, but uh, it's basically a bait and switch, uh, and there's a real struggle going on right now uh, to keep the residents of Dharavi in place. Um, the reading for next week um, is, uh, you're going to hate this reading for different reasons than you've hated readings in the past. This reading you will hate because uh, it seems like a, a collage of people's stories and it's hard to make sense. Well, your job is to make sense of these stories. It's stories of people in Dharavi and a few other places. I'm not sure how much, I think it's going to be mainly Dharavi. Um, but the issue is this hugely valuable land with people who are actually being quite productive economically and for the most part seem to be able to manage their situation except for the fact that it's extremely oppressive conditions. Part of it is the economic arrangements, but part of it is the physical infrastructure, the architecture, the uh, urban space, the lack of open space, the lack of access to fresh water and sanitation, the lack of transportation infrastructure, all of these things. And so it's all ma mashed together, and you're going to have to do your best to sort it out and figure it out. I want to... Um, Flooding, la di da. There's some guys in the sweatshop. Two of them are using cell phones. Continuing, the two guys on the cell phone are not paying as much as you are for your cell phone. The question underlying much of this is the question of equality and fairness. Um, when I told my son the second he was born that life was unfair and reminded him of that uh, every chance I got until he was about eight years old when he responded by saying well it should be and uh, that was a very convincing response and uh, he's right as someone who lives in a communist community in Cambridge uh, where we do everything by consensus in my co-housing community uh, there's a lot of discussion of fairness and one thing we've realized uh, very clearly is that if we fixate on fairness things get worse and so in miniature we have replicated the experience of fairness uh, that uh, the state socialist uh, experiments of the Soviet Union and China ran for quite a while. It turns out that a certain degree of uh, income inequality is uh, actually beneficial uh, so that you are rewarding people for their efforts and not rewarding people for for not doing their for not doing anything and so this is a timeless classic issue uh, but then on the other end what how much in income inequality is too much income inequality and that's a very good question uh, one that is continuing to absorb a great deal of attention from a lot of very smart people all over the world. And so we look at here at Gapminder, an organization uh, founded by Hans Rosling in uh, Scandinavia and Denmark, I believe, or Norway. Um, if you've seen TED Talks, there's a good chance you've seen his TED Talk. He's the one who swallows the sword. Uh, and he gives a brilliant narration of this data visualization where on the left hand the vertical scale we have life expectancy in years and on the um, horizontal scale we have income and so we see uh, over time these different countries uh, prospering uh, the population of the country is shown by the size of the circle so starting with data about 1800 we see multiple rounds of these different countries, China, the big red circle, 
Uh, the United States is the big yellow one out in front, uh, and it's racing up towards the upper right corner. The income per person is going up and up and up, and the life expectancy is going along with it. So there seems to be a very direct relationship between the benefits of society uh, as measured in life expectancy and per capita income. Now you'll notice that this is not measuring uh, income inequality or distribution, it's measuring per capita income. So it's averaged over the entire population. And so it's, uh, it's actually a very blunt instrument for measuring uh, how these things actually work. You see with a map in the upper right hand corner, Africa is in blue, Asia is in red, the Americas in yellow, and uh, Europe and uh, Russia, and at that time the Soviet Union, about now, uh, is in orange. And so we see all of these different countries every once in a while when my cursor passes over a, a circle, we see uh, a certain country pop in. And you see that uh, China is all over the place. And you can actually set it up so that it leaves tracks. Um, so this is a very interesting a demonstration of the relationship between social benefits and per capita average uh, income uh, distribution. And, uh, but there are other things. Uh, there are measurements that measure the income inequality within a country. Um, uh, if we go back to um, income uh, per capita, or, or here on this chart, gross national income per head. Here you notice we've taken away lots of countries, and the remaining countries uh, are the advanced uh, economies of Europe and the United States, and here in Canada. And here we have not just life expectancy on the vertical, we have all kinds of anything that is measured, measurable and is measured in terms of social quality is included in the aggregate scores measured along, along the left. And in this analysis, uh, up instead of being good is bad. So the higher you are on this list, the worst, the worst off the people are. And so uh, by cherry picking the data, and including only these few countries uh, at the very top end of the food chain of the development scale, as we've discussed in the past, uh, we get a, a slightly different portrayal. So this is a very small frame. Uh, we see that there is not a very clear relationship uh, between the social quality and per capita income. As a matter of fact, you see dots all over the place if, you, if there was a strong correlation between social benefits and income, you would see a straight line so that the wealthier the nation, the better the uh, social conditions, and the least wealthy of the nations would have the, the worst social conditions. Um, now, these countries admittedly were very carefully chosen so that the United States, it would, it would challenge our preconceptions that the United States is the best country in the world. Um, I just want to say before we go any further that the United States is the best country in the world. I just want to be clear about that. However, are we, the question is not are we the best country in the world or not. Uh, I think we are. Uh, but shouldn't we be better given all the great things that we've achieved? Now this is an interesting question. Given the great wealth of the United States, why aren't things better than they are? Some would say it's because we are the police of the world. We spend a great deal, actually a majority of our wealth on military, and thus that's what keeps us uh, socially poor, even though we are materially rich. Um, we look at other places like that here, not to pick on the United States alone. Uh, here's Sweden versus England and Wales. Uh, Sweden is indicative of uh, the Scandinavian model. The Scandinavian experiment is to charge enormously high tax, obscenely high tax rates. But instead of seizing that money and redistributing it to wealthy corporations and the military, um, they do this very strange thing. 
they take all that money away from everybody. They take about 60% uh, in taxes and they give it back to people in the form of social services and they give much more to the poorest people than they give to the wealthy people. But the key thing here, uh, and as indicated in this data, is that it benefits everyone. So you see here, infant. now we're measuring social uh, welfare through a different uh, indicator species, which is infant deaths per 1,000. Um, you'll notice the blue bars, no matter what the income level, uh, the infant mortality rate is about the same, and it is low. Whereas in England and Wales, uh, the mortality rate is higher for everyone, uh, but a lot higher for the poorest people. So a comparison between in, a government policy of extreme income redistribution uh, and social benefits and England where not so much. Um, England, United Kingdom is known for its um, social inequality, much like the United States. Now here's where it starts to get interesting. Instead of uh, graphing uh, the social benefits on the vertical uh, as before against income per capita, the, this graph shows income inequality. And this is the radical statement made by this uh, cut through the data. Uh, and you're welcome to find this in the TED Talk. I can't remember the author's name, Anderson, I think. Um, recently published TED Talk. His uh, data, his cut through the data, shows basically the idea that the greater the income inequality, the worse the social situation is for the people in the country. And he explains at great length in his 20-minute TED Talk why that might be. But in the meantime, uh, we introduce the idea in the context of social dualism that the more dualistic, the more uh, unequal, the more wealth concentrated in the 1% uh, in comparison with the 99% or the bottom 20%, uh, the more uh, serious the problems are for everyone. And uh, we look at that in terms of prison population. Uh, we look at it. Uh, so basically, the greater the income inequality, the higher the per capita prison population. So the greater the social unrest, the greater the criminality. In the United States, we have the extra thing of um, mandatory jail sentences for drug uh, possession that distorts it somewhat. Uh, then we look at, we're comparing, again, cherry-picking the data, admittedly, uh, but still it's quite interesting that the American states uh, with the greatest income inequality have the highest homicides uh, rates as well, and um, including Canada, just to riff off of um, uh, the movie by Michael Moore that reached a similar conclusion. Um, independent of gun ownership, gun possession, um, homicides uh, are much more closely connected to income inequality. Um, and here's the big one. We, and this is where the ideas we present in this course uh, start to hit home. We have a very strong tradition of telling ourselves in the United States that when you come to the United States, you have social mobility. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how much money you start out with, doesn't matter race, class, ethnicity, all of these things. Uh, if you are willing to work hard and study hard and do your best, you are going to succeed. You have a great chance of success, a greater chance than anywhere else in the world. Well, not not really, actually. These other countries that were admittedly cherry-picked for the purposes of showing this story, this uh, challenge to the prevailing story of social mobility in the United States, that the United States of these countries, the United States has by far the lowest social mobility as indicated by actual outcomes. Um, that uh, explains why the lottery is so popular in the United States. And so uh, the social mobility uh, is also a problem that is associated with income inequality. 